morning, good evening, wherever in the world you're watching from. It's Business Morning, live on Channels Television. I'm Ladi Williams. First of all, let's take a look at some business news. Uh, the insurance uh, regulator, the National Insurance Commission, has cancelled the registration licenses of two underwriting firms, Niger Insurance and Standard Alliance. The regulator's actions comes both uh, companies have struggled to operate for some time now with high-level insolvency and a liquidity crisis. In a statement, the Commission says the license revocation took effect from June the 21st. Meanwhile, the Commission has assured all stakeholders of the safety and protection of their interests. Now let's take a look at some uh, markets now, starting with the oil uh, market. The oil prices fell today after rising in the previous uh, three sessions, but uh, losses were limited on the view that global supply tightness will continue. So there's limited room for major producers such as Saudi Arabia uh, to boost their production. U.S. West Texas Intermediate Crude uh, slid about 44 cents to so $111.32 a barrel, uh, giving up earlier gains, while Brent crude futures for August dropped 61 cents to $117.37 a barrel. Also reversing an earlier gain, the August contract will expire uh, tomorrow, and uh, more active September contract uh, was at $113.14. That was down about 66 cents. Both for Brent and WTI rose more than 2% on Tuesday as concerns of a tight global supply outweighed fears that demand may slow in potential uh, future recession. The agreement between uh, the group of seven economic powers to explore ways to cap the price of Russian oil uh, to underpin the market sentiment. And the federal government issued 57 petroleum prospecting licenses to the successful awardees in the 2020 marginal field bid uh, round portion to the provisions of the Petroleum Industry Act uh, 2021. Speaking during the presentation, the Minister of State for Petroleum Resources, Chief Timipre Silva, says the exercise, which has attracted government revenue to about 200 billion naira and $7 million respectively, will also contribute to the reserves growth uh, when the field starts producing oil. To take a listen. Thank you very much. In 2020, the federal government of Nigeria commenced the process of reactivation of some oil wells that were redundant. Prior to that time, and for 10 years in a stretch, those fields had no activity. Two years after a bid round started for those marginal fields, right here at this event, the federal government is issuing 57 petroleum prospecting licenses to Nigerian entities. The Petroleum Industry Act has stimulated quite a number of structure and governance to the day's event, which is a big win for oil receipts in Nigeria. The fiscal provisions in the PIA ranks among the best globally. I therefore urge the awardees to seize the opportunities to quickly develop their fields and enjoy the full benefit of the PIA. It's a dual presentation, the Petroleum Prospecting License and the introduction of host community development regulation, essentially a law that will guide how the oil producers will relate to their host communities. To the glory of God. The 2020 marginal feed bid run exercise, in respect of which PPLs are being issued today, has attracted above 200 billion naira at a site, seven million dollars component respect, respectively, as revenue to the government. When we started this bid, around oil was hovering around 45 dollars. Today we've got it at over 100 dollars. So. This is the perfect timing, and it's more cream on the cake. 30 licenses have been issued in the past. This round is, however, significant because the bankers, financiers, the IOCs, regulators, the lawmakers, and the prospective oil producers are all in one room to enable a speedy collaboration and process that will lead to first oil very quickly. We expect that um, additional, at least close to a million barrels um, of oil should come into the country's production within the next uh, three to five years. At over hundred dollars to the barrel of oil, Nigeria once again has got the opportunity to grow its reserves, grow indigenous ownership, and earn more oil receipts. Olu Phillips, Channel Television News. You can stand beside them. 
All right, now to our first conversation. The Nigerian Exchange Group will be having the NGX CEO's roundtable meeting uh, July 7th uh, with the theme, Creating the Enabling Ecosystem for Accessing Capital from the Nigerian Capital Market. Let's discuss expectations now with Mr. Jude. Uh, no, that's, uh, uh, we have joining us uh, Tony Ibeziako, head primary market uh, NGX. Uh, pardon me there. <laughs> uh, join us uh, this morning. Great to have you. Good morning. Morning. So uh, what uh, initiatives have the NGX embarked on to further enable a thriving capital market ecosystem? Um, good morning once more. Uh, and thanks for having me on the program. Um, I think um, what NGX has done um, to ensure um, a thriving capital market um, ecosystem and also have a, a sustainable capital market um, is hinged on um, three or four pillars. Um, the first pillar is true innovation. Um, so we've got to um, become more innovative in the products and services that we, that we um, push out to the market. The second one is um, Technology. I mean, everybody is talking about technology, technology today. Um, the NGX or um, exchanges traditionally are um, B2B sort of um, business. That's how the business model is, is configured. What we've seen um, with innovation and technology, um, the business needs to um, transit into um, being a B2C um, business, because at the end of the day, what we also want to do is to galvanize um, retail inclusion and retail participation um, in our market through the use of technology. The third, um, which is um, the most important, is also um, thought leadership and advocacy. Um, if you look at the history of our market, you will find out that um, traditionally, every time that we've had a surge or there's a scalability in the activities in the capital market, it's largely driven by um, advocacy. So the current uh, management of the exchange, um, it's very deliberate in its top leadership um, position and its advocacy um, ideas, and um, they believe in partnership um, with different stakeholders, um, government entities, policymakers, um, market intermediaries, um, to begin to um, push out um, products or services or use of technology that can not only grow the market, but catalyze um, the current levels of activities that we are seeing on the floor. Um, from a product perspective, um, you would see that there's a lot of um, movement or there's a lot of appetite now uh, with the millennials um, in terms of uh, things like digital assets or digital products. Um, and there's also the need for us to tap into um, the SDG goals of, um, of um, global sustainable initiatives uh, mantra that is going on. So in that perspective, um, we are at the forefront of um, sustainable finance, be it um, green bonds, uh, be it climate bonds, uh, or be it um, even Sukuko infrastructure type of funds, which are new um, products that we are trying to push into the market. Quite interesting. Uh, but now the, the CEO's roundtable uh, meeting, that, that's coming up. What can we expect from this meeting? Um, yes. So, um, like I said earlier on, um, there is that deliberateness um, from the current management to bring um, different stakeholders. If you look at um, primary issuances uh, in traditional exchanges in emerging market, you will find out that uh, most of the time, um, for primary issuances, you probably have one at best two IPOs um, in a year. So the CEO Roundtable um, is basically a platform to look at 
our listed companies look at prospects and um, bring in policymakers um, and bring in market intermediaries for us to talk in a, in a closed door atmosphere to understand the impediments or what are the barriers to entry um, in terms of listing or promoting capital formation um, in public market. Um, like you rightly mentioned, um, the event is scheduled to hold um, on Thursday, um, 7th Ju um, July. It's, it's by Zoom, again, use of technology. And um, the Honorable Minister, the event will be headlined by the Honorable Minister um, for um, Industry, Trade and Investment, um, Otomba um, Adini um, Adebajo, the Honorable Minister for Finance, Budget and National Planning, Dr. Zainab Ahmed, and our very own uh, Amirabu um, DG, uh, the Director General for the Securities and Exchange Commission, um, Mr. Lamidu um, Yaguda. It's an event that we hope um, at the end of the day, because we want to be very deliberate um, about what the CEO event is, um, we want to be able to identify issues that would help promote um, listings um, in the public capital market using different innovative products. But we also want to make sure that even the listed companies, um, what are their pains? We want to make sure that um, from an advocacy perspective, we retain the companies as much as possible while providing um, a, a, a robust platform for them to achieve their strategic um, intent for being a listed company. Right. Well, uh, talking about tech, now that's been a major discourse now, particularly for companies, you know, the NGX. Uh, what are you doing to attract uh, investments, you know, in the tech space? Um, so, um, everybody is talking tech today. Um, and um, if you look at what is happening today in Nigeria and in, indeed Africa, um, you will see that there's a lot of um, capital formation, as it were, going on in the tech and fintech industry. Um, if you look at um, in the last um, two to three years, Nigeria um, is always in the forefront of um, direct investments um, for, our, for tech and technology companies. I think in... Um, 2020 across Africa, um, the, the quantum of capital that came into Nigeria was about $1.3 um, billion. Now that is significant capital that is coming into the economy. What we want to do from an NGX perspective is to create a, a, a framework, a platform, you know, to begin to attract these tech companies or fintech companies to continue to scale, to continue to access capital, but do it in a more transparent way um, within the capital uh, market space. And in that regard, um, the Securities and Exchange Commission and um, the NGX is in the forefront of launching a specialized board, which we call um, the Technology Board. And the, essence of this technology board is to get our the unicorns, our technology companies um, that are currently accessing capital offshore to be able to come into the public market um, and have those um, companies listed. It, it would interest you to know that most of these companies, most of these companies and um, fintech companies are actually Nigerian companies, but um, if you dig a little bit further, you will find out that most of them are registered offshore um, somewhere, uh, maybe in the United States, um, Delaware and all that. Um, and we think even from an advocacy perspective, uh, from a wealth creation perspective, 
and even from a financial security perspective, um, we are of the humble opinion that um, we need to begin to bring um, this transformation that is happening within the public capital space, because it has implications for us. Um, we wouldn't want in the next decade or two, you will find out that um, our financial security system or financial in, um, infrastructure is being run by companies um, off somewhere in Dubai, Mauritius, or in the United States. So um, the tech board, it's a deliberate attempt um, to have what is going on in the technology and fintech space um, to bring it into the public market space where there can be more transparency, visibility, um, and also ensure good corporate governance. The tech board, um, as of today, um, we are waiting final rules approval from uh, the Securities and Exchange Commission. And once we have that um, side by side, with market stakeholders and other regulators. We've been speaking to um, a lot of the founders um, and a lot of the technology and fintech companies um, on the need for them to get on board and continue to form capital scale, um, but do it in a more structured way. Um, hopefully before the end of the year, we would see um, the launch of the technology board, but we want to do it with maybe one or two listings just to show um, the amount of traction and to bring credibility um, to the initiative. Thank you. Right, right. I'll, I'll be watching out for that uh, tech board. Uh, maybe it might be like the tech-heavy NASDAQ we, we have in the U.S. <laughs> and, uh, yes, so that, is, that is actually what we want to do. It, it's, okay. it's styled towards the, um, the NASDAQ um, in the U.S. It's absolutely regulation light. Um, we've, we've flipped with regulation on its head. So instead of regulation being a, disrupting um, the, the flow of tech companies, their agile, their valuation metrics is different. We've actually used regulation in this case to be an enabler in um, forming the value proposition and the rules for the tech board. So it's interesting times, and, and we look forward to it. Right. And, and we've seen most of these uh, tech companies, you know, raise record amounts, you know, of, of funding. Uh, do you think investors, you know, when this tech board goes live and do you think investors will be keen on these offerings and or do you think they might see them as risky? Um, good question. Um, the way we've positioned the, um, the technology board, we've done it in such a way that uh, because of the peculiarity of tech companies, um, we understand that first and foremost, um, not everybody, not every investor understands the tech company or tech companies, their valuation, their business model, um, and their revenue streams. Um, but we also know that you have um, qualified um, institutional and retail investors that are quite conversant um, with tech companies with their valuation. Um, and um, we also realized that using um, regulation, um, there also needs to be a lot of capacity building um, across the value chain um, so that when um, these tech companies um, become listed, um, you don't have um, investors getting bonds. Um, that's the, the first thing. Um, so investor protection is very key. Um, on the way we've um, positioned the value proposition. But we've also made it in such a way that um, for the things that happen during the boom don't come, does not reoccur here, where um, not every tech company would qualify um, to be listed on the tech board. Um, there are a few um, corporate governance and um, requirements um, that these companies would need to satisfy anyway um, before being listed. We want to make sure that those that are listed are the best of the crop. Right. And it's available to uh, investors that understand the peculiarities of the tech industry 
um, the valuation, the revenue methodology, um, and understand the business generally, and understand also the risk profile. Right, understanding. Very, very important to uh, know what you're investing in. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Tony Bezerko, head primary market uh, NGX. So it was great having you on the program. Thank you very much, and have a good day. All right. So we'll take a moment now. All right, now let's take a look at what's happening on Apex Commodity Exchange. Well, it's uh, mostly green on the commodity market summary. Uh, let's uh, get the details now from Suleiman Suleiman, the financial market analyst with Apex. Uh, great to have you on the program. Good morning, lady. Morning. Uh, uh, give us a rundown of uh, activities on the exchange for the week ended. Yeah, over the past week, activities on the exchange was actually uh, witnessed a significant tick with the total turnover returning going up by 9.45 times from 1.03 billion in the previous week to 9.83 billion era for the week on the review. The total volume traded on the exchange also witnessed the same sentiment as it rose 13.11 times from 3.1 million contracts in the previous week to about 40.8 million contracts in the week on the review. However, the number of deals traded on the exchange reduced from 488 deals in the previous week to 425 deals in the past week, representing a 12.91% downturn. The FX Commodity Index, the ACI, which comprises of maize, soybean, paddy rice, and sorghum, closed the week in the red by 4.15%, going from 492.47 points to 472.04 points. The FX Export Index, the AEI, which comprises of cocoa and ginger, also declined marginally by 0.18%, moving from 191.58 points to 191.24 points in the concluded week. So breaking down the individual contract traded on the exchange, the volume of sorghum traded increased considerably over the week, going from 454,000 to approximately 3.5 million contract traded. Maize also witnessed the same sentiment, with wild paddy rice and soybean witnessed significant uptick also. However, sorghum, cocoa, and cashew witnessed decreases in volume traded. In terms of price performance of individual commodities, sorghum rose by 0.27% during the week under review, representing a 74 Kobo price increase to close the week at 288.26 Naira. Sesame rounded up the list of gainers in the week under review, returning a 38.01 price increase representing a 211 Naira 20 Kobo increase to close the week at 766 Naira 83 Kobo. May's price on the exchange, however, witnessed a downturn of 14.41% to close the week under review at 225 Naira 62 Kobo. Paddy rise also closed the week in the red, falling by 1.21% to close the week at 243.95 Naira. Ginger, soybean, cocoa, and cashew nut all close the week flat, maintaining the same price levels from the previous week. Do not forget to follow us on, at fxnigeria.com on our various social media platforms for more updates. You can also check our website at africanexchange.com. Thank you, Daddy. Oh, All right, that, not, not a bad uh, outing there. Thank you so much, Suleiman Suleiman, financial market analyst with AFEX. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. All right, now let's take the conversation now forward now, looking at two groups in the agricultural uh, value chain in Nigeria. That's the smallholder farmers and the processors. We have, uh, how can we get these activities uh, between the two more efficient? Uh, well, to have this conversation, uh, we have Tolu Owolabi, National Sales Manager at Apex, join us right here uh, from our budget studio. Great to have you. Thank you. Hi, Ladi. Good morning. Great to Good have morning. you. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, thank you for having me. <laughs> well, well, talk us through operations between, you know, smallholder farmers and uh, processors and, and the importance of local uh, trade in Nigeria. Um, uh, thank you, Ladi, again. I would say that the importance of local trade in Nigeria today will be one, um, food availability um, within the country, um, not just for commercial, uh, not just for 
human consumption, but I mean for also processors as well. But I'll also say it helps to protect us against international risk, right? Um, like we've seen with the Russia and Ukraine issue this year, um, prices of some commodities that we have to import into the country, like wheat, have gone up astronomically. Um, I would also say that um, local trade would help to increase our productivity and production as a nation. But most importantly is the fact that it will also keep our domestic funds in-house and reduce the outflow of domestic funds that would obviously happen through importation. Right, and, and what, are, what would you say are the challenges to local trade here? Um, I would say that one would be infrastructure challenges, right? And these would include good road networks as well as proper warehousing systems and storage facilities um, because of the logistics that takes these commodities to move from one area to the other, especially because most of your farmers are located in very deep areas, um, I mean, deep villages um, around the country. I would also say um, access to adequate financing because obviously you need financing to be able to trade properly. Um, without proper financing, that may th that will create some um, form of um, challenges. I'd also say lack of proper standardisation, right, of 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 processes and um, commodities across. And I would say that um, farmer, farmer knowledge, right, uh, that probably needs to improve in order for us to even have enough commodities um, to be able to trade. I mean, you have to have commodities to trade properly would be some of the challenges I'd say um, are facing us right now. Quite quite a number of, of challenges there. And I know Apex, you guys have your hands mm -hmm. full, but what are the key ways uh, that Apex can ensure yeah. effective trade from you know the rural communities to big buyers and multinational? Um, so one of the things we're doing today is um, using technology to improve market fragmentation. Um, one of the other things, some of the other things we're doing today is also introducing products um, that can help um, both the f smallholder farmers as well as traders and partners um, get access to adequate finance um, to be able to trade. We're also doing um, certification for some of our farmers. We're also trying to train and develop our farmers properly. But we're also putting infrastructure. We also have put infrastructure and will continue to do so in place. Um, and I'm talking storage right now. Um, we have about 130 plus warehouses in, um, across over 26 states of the country. And the idea of this is that farmers don't have to travel long distances to be able to bring in the commodities. And this um, obviously would help to ensure that you don't have so much defects before and protect the quality before it gets to the warehouse. Um, last but not the least is also our standardization and grading process, which we pay very strict attention to at the warehouse and the proper warehousing system. How do we ensure the quality of grains, you know, to, to strengthen both local trade and also promote export? Um, so I would say one of that, like I earlier said that we currently do, is certification of farmers. This is very important. But secondly, and very key, um, would also be that there has to be a standardization of processes across major stakeholders that play um, in this field. You know, just having the same process and the same conversation, ensuring that things are done in the right standard would help, you know, and that would even probably go a long way to reduce export losses that we currently face today as a nation. But was there a difference between, you know, uh, promoting local trade and uh, food protectionism? Um, yeah, there's a slight, I mean, there's a slight difference. So um, when you try to promote food, the idea of promoting food, food trade locally is to ensure that one, you have increased productivity within your country as a whole. I mean, if you don't have enough, you clearly cannot even um, take outside of the country. But on the other hand, um, the securitization is also ensuring that um, one, you want to make sure that in the in, in the in the event that there's any issue or challenge um, from other countries, you are protected, protected in the sense that you are not. Um, you're not vulnerable to those commodities that you would otherwise have had to get in from um, outside of your own local production as a country. And that just helps to protect even the processors who probably have leaned very heavily on some of these um, imported commodities as well.
Right, so uh, very interesting uh, times uh, right now with uh, food security being uh, the major conversation globally uh, at this point with the war in Ukraine and all of that. But I guess that uh, we have to also find a way to mm -hmm. uh, secure food right here uh, in Nigeria. Thank you so much, uh, Tolu Uwolabi, National Sales Manager Absolutely. at Apex. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Have a beautiful day. You too. Okay. All right, we'll take a moment now. Now, let's head on to the markets. We have Ini right there with the details. Thank you so much, Ladi. Good morning and welcome to the market segment. Uh, let's see how the market traded yesterday. That's right. We're back in the bear uh, sentiment or region, but uh, analysts will tell you we cannot say that uh, we're really in the in the bear region <laughs> yet. It's just a... Uh, God forbid we're in the bear one region. Two. It's just one two in the water, <laughs> so don't be afraid. But yesterday, the market shed 0.31% uh, back to 51 1,803, and then we have also lost that 28,000 trillion naira uh, level. We're now at 27, or even though it's really close, 27.928 there, hoping that uh, it will recover. And then uh, we saw that there was an increase in volume and value, but deals were reduced yesterday, and then uh, value ended at 12.85 billion naira. MTN was a major mover of the market, uh, always, anyway, always. Yesterday, MTN lost two percent from its share price so i guess we can see why the market was down only consumer goods shown yet